Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to welcome you today to our second podcast episode of today's top tech leaders. The goal of this podcast is to share insights and knowledge of top CTOs and product leaders on their leadership and what they've learned throughout their journey. We'll cover management tips and tricks, organizational structures, tools, and best practices on how to successfully lead your product team. Our goal is to bring valuable insights to CTOs, CPOs of all seniority. I'm Mark Clemens, the founder and CEO of Code Control and 9AM. And today's podcast, I, can, I have the pleasure to welcome Tiomir Nedev. He's an engineer as well as an entrepreneur who has co-founded two companies and has over 12 years of experience working across the EU and the US. He's a long year member of the code control community and likes working in fintech, health tech, and anything related to drones and ML projects. Welcome to Yomir, and thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So to get started, um, I would like to hear a bit about yourself, where you're from, what you're working on at the moment. Yeah, I'm from Bulgaria. I now live here as well after traveling a bit, studying and so forth. And I moved here and live here. And I actually just started uh, I'm back into the drone industry. I now leading a new team of uh, drone engineers, and I'm very excited. Very nice. So you, you fly drones yourself in, in your free time, in your leisure time? Yeah, first I didn't fly. First I just crashed drones. Then I started learning how to fly, and then slowly I went into programming them and to kind of a step out as a platform. Really nice. Very nice. So today we want to talk a bit about how to build a real dream team. Um, but before we get into that, I would like to hear from you. How would you describe your career as a CTO, as a developer within three words? I think that'd be quite hard. I think the first one is very easy. That'd be a passion. I like to follow my passion. I always try to follow what I like and kind of uh, see how things go there. Uh, then the second will be frustration, probably, I guess. You always get the roadblocks, you don't know what to do, and you always doubt yourself. So I kind of still use my passion to push over this frustration. And for the third one, I don't know. Uh, I guess it's more aspiration. So this would be uh, what are the general goals? What is the benefit of what you're doing? and how it could be more beneficial to me, to the society, and to all what that we combine together. Very nice. Well, it sounds to me like you like your job and you, you like uh, what you've chosen to do. Um, in this context, what is it that is most satisfying for you at work? Or is there a specific work setup that you've experienced that has been super satisfying for you? Yeah, I think uh, it's what it is, is when I got to work, I want to see that people are very inspired. They go to the, go and work with passion. They are excited for the next day. They, they In the morning, they start sharing what are their thoughts of the evening. They couldn't sleep because something was begging them. They wanted to improve something. So this means that the team is very engaged, that we follow common goals and that together we are kind of a think that much for, for this topic that we can just get it out of the heads. Interesting. Um, perhaps I, I want to get to the stream team later on, but um, does that mean that you would go more for personality and passion than skill when building a team? Yeah, I was thinking about this. Yeah, definitely I would choose personality. I think people who are, have the good technical abilities and general good foundation are then very easily inspired and have the ability to build upon and have their technical skills and everything uh, to follow up. I think it's a lot easy rather than hiring very, very smart people who lack some of the skills and kind of poison the whole team. Mm. So meaning no, no toxic people, meaning um, people that are somehow in line with the, the values, with the idea of the company um, that they, they work for. Um, are there any other skills that, that pop in mind that, that you think 
are absolutely crucial. I mean, aside of that, perhaps there's some base knowledge of developing when you want to be a developer, but um, what are the other skills that you look for? Yeah, well, something that I found that it's a bit uh, kind of uh, unusual, but I think great technical people have very weird queer quirks and obsessions. So if you see every developer who is a very passionate, very good at what they're doing, they have, you have to ask them, but and I have to kind of dig deeper and deeper, but they have those obsessions. Maybe they come from uh, early childhood, they were inspired by some technology or something. So they kind of start following those those trends and how to go deeper and deeper. So all those great people and great technical people have, have those. So I, I kind of try to have a deeper conversation and find those and and see uh, what are they, what are they obsess- what what are they obsessed about? What they choose this quirky technology to use? Why did they choose that? Why did they choose that? And how they come that they've been inspired by something that I didn't even think about before that someone might find interesting. <laughs> does but does that mean that you um, think it's important to let your team members bring these obsessions or these these passions? to work, even though they might not be completely related with work? Well, I think those are transferable skills. So they might be obsessed with that, or they might find it very, very interesting, but this interest kind of creates a good skill set. Maybe they learn something new, they kind of learn a lot from, learn a lot from, from, from that thing. So I believe then changing their frame and a uh, different environment, then this means that they could bring those skills and, and uh, use the, the kind of the whole environment to, to give them a different direction to use those. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. I, I mean, if the next thing that pops in mind to me right away is a four-day work week or play days on, on Friday where everyone can just work on whatever they like, potentially work-related or not work-related. Is that something that you that you like or that you've done in the past? I haven't. I'm interested in that, but I haven't seen it work very well. People most of the time are busy with work and I haven't seen a company environment that allows for that. Even that we say that it does, I haven't seen it work in teams. Maybe it works. Maybe it works. I know that Google and other big companies are trying to do that and doing, I just haven't been personally uh, in a, such teams or having ability to create that environment calm enough that you can sp- spend a whole day just figuring things out. No, no, I, I agree. I, the same for me. I, I would have uh, always wanted to do it and I never found a setup in which it worked. Um, there's always the question as well of limited resources, obviously, that you're like, okay, now mm-hmm. how do we um, use the resource we have the best possible way? Um, and then four day work week might be something different because you give people time to recharge. While if you work on something else within the company, it's, it's sometimes tricky. I, I fully agree. I'm, and I tried myself and uh, how often have I tried with our CTO to um, start a little side projects because we want to do something on top. Um, and it always failed because we had our priorities with, with code control 9am. Yeah. Um, but in the end, I guess what you're saying is giving space to these these passion to these interests that people have hobbies or um, the like is something that plays into the context of of motivation or um, into generally skill transfer you mentioned Um, where does it have the biggest impact or the biggest impact is that it means that those people were genuinely interested in those topics they, they spend time figuring it out. They spend time not going to the general trends or follow up what is, what is just trendy, what is the modern the next modern technology, what is it? Those small quirks, maybe different technologies, means that they've been inspired. It means that they've let their mind spread a bit and follow different direction that the common sense may, makes. So, so, uh, kind of this makes them think out of the box, makes them learn a lot of new skills, makes them a lot more 
putting thoughts into every day, every action they take rather than kind of uh, using autopilot to go forward in their careers or just follow follow the trends and see maybe what uh, new skill earns them more money or whatever else that they find in, uh, like trendy or mm. quickly uh, valuable. Mm. Okay. But when thinking of a dream team, and I, I mean, I know that we have, uh, at Code Control 9 we had constant change for sure. We, we always try to find out what is exactly the perfect role. Now in product, it's a bit more defined, right? You, you know, you need developers, perhaps you need front end, mm -hmm. back end, or you need mobile and back end or full stack, and, and you need a product manager and, and so on. So it's a bit clearer defined, but is there still within building the first team for a company, um, a certain kind of, um, magic sauce or a combination of skills, a combination of personality types that you would look for, um, whenever building a team. Yeah, I think first team yeah, it's of course, it's very, very important and early new companies, startups, they very often fail because they couldn't hire well. Maybe they have the money to hire one person, two people, maybe three, maybe a bit more, but it's very important that those people are the right people. So writing the company values early on, making sure that you don't try to hire fast and hire very, very slowly and have the right fit for the company is uh, what's most important. Uh, then those early adopters of that, because those would be the people that uh, build the company value. They won't be the investors. It won't be, maybe it won't be you as a founder or what, whatever role is in your company. It will be those first tech engineers or product people that are the ones who build the actual value. So it's very important to treat them that well and to have a quick fed feedback loop of what are the, what are the passions? Do they perfectly fit with the company? Are they aligned with the same values? Are they inspired by the company's goals? Uh, are they happy every day at work and so forth? And those people mm -hmm. also have to be kind of a risk, risky and bold and take statements. Those are not the engineers that they'll have the 20 years of experience and know this thing, how it's done. And they kind of uh, want to keep doing it the same way. Those are the people who try to break stuff. They're not afraid to move around things. They're not afraid to be fully hands-on and to start building. It's very interesting. Um, um, there was one thing in there that reminded me of, of something that a, um, a CTO from the Berlin startup scene, and I, I met him in 2010, and he was already back then. I mean, he was part of the dot-com bubble the first time and, and had been CTO for probably six companies already. Um, and then I spoke with him five years ago and said, is there a way that you can help us build uh, the next product that we're planning? And then he said to me, Mark, look, um, I've built so many companies, I became a miserable developer because I only see problems and I built a too perfect product. When I was younger and I have never made these experiences, I was the better, the better developer for, for a startup, the better engineer, the better CTO. Um, but these days I can consult from the outside, but please don't let me code anymore. <laughs> so, so I think it's very interesting what you said with the experience, right? Sometimes if you have 20 years of experience, you, you might not have the right mindset or agility anymore um, to be a developer or senior developer in a, in a super early stage. So it doesn't need to count for everyone, but I, I thought this was an interesting point. Do you agree with that or? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm very, very worried. I'm now getting into the uh, kind of maturity in terms of my technical abilities and what's uh, my career. And for me, it's a bit scary, to be honest. It's scary that I'm trying to look bold, boldly forward, trying to kind of get the next inspiration. And sometimes I get in the frame that I only see the problems. I see why this can be done. Oh, this is not the correct way to do things. This is not the right uh, mindset or whatever. So this kind of bugs me and I'm trying to see how to improve myself and step out of my shoes, uh, put myself into different kind of environment with different people. Maybe I'll go to the young engineers, 
students and so forth. So they get my inspiration and kind of uh, open my mind for all new ideas. So mm. I think that's very important. I'm currently trying to find the good ways to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, product is potentially also product management or even going into the low code, no code direction to, to just keep this this super quick and dirty mindset is, is perhaps something that, that, that can help. Yeah? Yeah, but I think some, a lot of people have these challenges. Yeah, yeah something lately that I've been kind of uh, thinking about more often is kind of uh, the European versus the American way of doing things. I work in quite a few American companies in the US and I've worked now with larger uh, European companies and startups. And I see this going up back and forward that a lot more often than not, American companies and mindset is we start building today and try to do first write their hello world, then next thing and next thing and just build and try things. While in the same time here, and probably this is more often as well in Eastern Europe where people have a lot of theoretical, theoretical knowledge and a lot of theoretical studies they try to plan too much ahead and they get scared. It's very, then hard, it's very starting to get very hard to jump into the pool and start doing things. So I always, when I start with a new task, maybe it's a completely new field, maybe something that my team has never done. I always try to push them into towards, let's start doing this. Let's start build this very, very simple thing. I know it looks very ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense to do. It's very simple. It's funny, whatever. But just doing it proves that it's not it's valuable. And you go to the, and as as the first you build this, then it comes the second thing you want to push forward and build. Then the third one, and then the ball starts rolling. And I see how this it's a lot a lot easier. And I always try to step into that that shoes and kind of think of that way. Very interesting. Um... I think something from um, the last podcast uh, pops up in my mind that is um, the, the question of product mindset of the development team. And mm -hmm. what, you, what you say is, to, to me, it gives this kind of a methodology of getting people into a product mindset. Because if you build small things, you iterate on top, you, you don't put too much theory on it, but you make it very practical and you make it very um, hands-on and therefore you see the product and you get more involved. Is, is, is that part of the result? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's also, I think scary is also a good word for it because once you start getting deeper into the technology, you see, oh, I don't know this, I don't know that, that looks too complicated for me. How would I gonna do that? Or maybe it's the product that you're thinking, not just the technology. But then as much as more you read forward and you expand your mind, then you see how little you know, how little skills you have, and you kind of panic and then you're scared to start because you're going to fail. So it's a lot easier to fail very, very small, write the hello world and then go forward. Mm. Nice. Yeah, it's also a very good statement for, for entrepreneurs. Yeah, I was also very inspired and kind of uh, put me into the shoes watching, for example, how SpaceX built their Starbase. If you watch the early videos, you see how people just went there and started welding stuff and you can see the ugly welds and you see, well, this become a rocket now? It doesn't make sense. Well, what? And you see these big machines going in and just people start building rockets with their welders. And you start thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I can build a rocket in my garage. It doesn't seem like too hard. No. Yeah, and I think it's the uh, I think it's a perfect example SpaceX, and I, I think I saw a documentary on on Netflix um, about it because Elon Musk managed to get a, quite a few um, NASA scientists on board, right? That were kind of um, and from other industries as well that were kind of sick of this um, "don't fail" approach, um, which made everything so slow and so little innovative, and this kind of um, we can do this and here's the cash and we, we run and we just fail and we run again and we, we iterate on it, um, excited them and made them build something way better, right? <laughs> so, yeah. um, absolutely great example. Yeah. Looking back at the, at the teams, um, we spoke a bit about 
the technical skills versus soft skills. Um, I think a bit about motivation and what, what people need to bring. Um, but when it comes to choosing people, you still need to identify skill, no? Um, there is a there is a recruiting process, right? You have the first people. You say, okay, I like like them per, from personality. You put perhaps the value based um, interviews front, and you say, okay, how much do they fit to the company, and and what do they bring to the company? But then there still needs to be a technical assessment, right? Is is, is that how do you take this? Because I think it's every company does it differently. Um, do you do live coding sessions? Do you just ask questions? Do you use any external tools, Codility, HackerRank, and the like? Or what is your approach to um, mm. finding the right tech skill? Yeah. Uh, so initially, when I was my early hires, I tried to do technical questions. I tried to give them tasks. And I see that this didn't work for me. I didn't align with them. I didn't feel uh, kind of a, I didn't bond with them. I didn't feel what are they, their passion, what are what are they doing and what what they learned from through their journey or developer journey or their career. So instead I switched to a different strategy where I mostly asked about their journey, ask about how they came on to be, how they came to learn this technology, what inspired them, what are the steps that they took to go from zero to where they are now. And then I started asking more about getting deeper into their projects. Maybe they have a GitHub that they built and I kind of liked and I saw some interesting projects. So I like to get deeper into that and really step into and look at the code, see what are they, they're doing, what are the decisions they took, why they take those decisions, what were the problems they're facing, how did they solve them and so forth and really, really dig into those things. And then you see how people kind of uh, do they speak with passion about those topics? Do they do they look like they actually had to figure out what was the problem, how they figure out what uh, how to solve this, uh, what was their process behind this? How do they learn? How do they learn new skills? And I and I see this uh, like more often than not, the people who were were really uh, inspired who are really like good, really like know what they're doing. They will kind of go in and be very, very happy because those people were proud of their work. They're proud of their projects. Maybe they're also proud of their failures. They're proud of their uh, decisions, those, those things, or maybe even they're a bit ashamed of some parts of, of, of their work. And maybe they, they kind of will share that and this great not only that you learn more about people, what were their journey, what were their skills, but you also uh, kind of bond with them and see, start imagining, okay, maybe this person is now explaining me to me this code tomorrow. Maybe you explain it to other engineers in the team, maybe to someone else. You learn about their soft skills, how they communicate those ideas, what were the big problems they faced, how, how, did, how do they, those people learn, how they solve problems. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, I think, what's most valuable. But this doesn't also mean that there were, they will be great team members that they fit perfectly. So uh, I certain when it's possible to kind of do test runs with those people and have, have them in the company, depending on the company, maybe for one month, maybe for two, three months, then test those people, see how they fit in and start if they, they fit good with the team and start working well. And uh, and then it's, today it's very, un unlike probably 20 years ago, it's very easy to hire people and to quickly iterate and test. Maybe you want to have freelancer from all, freelancer from anywhere in the world, makes, the, makes things very uh, kind of open and easy to do. So I think this is a, as well as a good approach to fail fast and see how things go and if the people fit. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think, and it's something nice in the end in, in, in a market where um, there is a bit more liquidity, meaning, of course, developers are, are wanted and needed, but at the same time, a lot of people move to freelance and you, you have more flexibility in saying, let's start working together. Let's see where it goes and um, if there is the perfect fit and, and the right skill set. Yeah. Now, 
you mentioned failing and i think failing there's one part as well that is um retaining talent or not retaining talent i think but you already say i think as a developer it's probably nice to work with you in a team but um, there's probably still case in which um someone wants to leave or product issues or financial issues in the startup or something like that what what is your your approach in in having the lowest fluctuation possible well when someone wants to leave like initially everyone has a good motivation they most often than not people are in, are excited when they start a new project join a new team but coming into the next few months maybe it's three months for some six months for others people start having doubts they they lose of the, some of their motivation uh, i think people don't quit just right away there are issues that they arise it grinds their gears every day so slowly it builds up until until they can't take anymore so I think it's important and what seeing teams that work is that I like uh, to have a completely open environment where everyone's able to share, everyone's uh, kind of uh, motivated to share and not just to to have a like open conversation, less one-to-one -one conversation or what's happening more, we're sharing the whole team. And as well as having a, I'll repeat myself, but deeper conversation one-on-one -on -one with those people and try to see what they think or maybe what are the other team members that seem that they're a bit irritated at the moment or maybe something else. So those, this is how we can learn that it already the process of, of grinding started. So they start, the pressure starts to build. So it's important to address those issues. Maybe it's sometimes it's something very, very trivial that they don't like. Maybe it's some other team member that doesn't work. Maybe it's something in the office. Maybe it's something else. But uh, it's a lot easier to find and fix those issues. Uh, but companies still don't do it. And people still uh, find it a lot easier to close their eyes and ignore, ignore the signs that something's not so well held up or they try to avoid conversation or maybe they're busy or something else, but it's important to have those conversations and kind of uh, uh, get the people feel open, like completely open and uh, mm -hmm. comfortable with you that uh, we are in the same boat, in the same company, same family, and that uh, we want to solve those issues. And then this also kind of uh, makes, feel, makes the people feel important in the company they feel uh, uh, they feel aligned with the goals and they feel that uh, it's just a good environment for them so maybe uh, it will stop those some of those processes yeah yeah I, I think I hear uh, you're strong on the values honesty transparency support and trust uh, I think these these kind of uh, elements are here there that if you if you approach it like that you will retain a lot of uh, great time. Yeah. The problem is that everyone says and talks about those, but uh, it's hard to figure out if if you're go going to a company, does this company actually use or uh, uses those values and uh, builds this environment, or are they just saying it as a kind of a by by uh, no. reflex? No. Yeah, I agree. So we're coming almost to an end, um, but I would like to ask you one last question. Is, um, is there anything specific that you would um, advise CTOs or hiring managers who are struggling to attract top talent to do so that they actually get better talent and that they um, get better applicants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think managers often forget that or don't know that Great engineers actually inspire other great engineers to join the company. So I would always try to put those great people in front of the company before the company, before the company in front and let shine, let those engineers shine. Maybe some of those people are very inspired by their work. They could kind of present a lecture at the university, maybe at hackerspace, maybe it's something else that kind of brings people together. This passion is, kind of uh, uh, poisonous to everyone. So it will 
kind of a leak out and other people will join. And those engineers are inspired by other engineers that do great work, seeing how they're, uh, how, how well they're doing, what interesting problems they solve, it will uh, bring other people along. Very nice, yeah. Cool, that, that, that's, that's very interesting and I fully agreed. So um, with that, I want to say a big, big thank you. It's been uh, really interesting, very inspire, inspiring and uh, a lot of expertise um, that you've shared. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to you, how can they uh, connect with you? Well, they can reach me anywhere. I'll try to respond. I'm very uh, often uh, uh, reached out by some strange people. I try to to uh, talk to anyone. So LinkedIn is a good place. I uh, think uh, also email or any other place that they found me, it will be great to communicate. I'm always looking forward to meeting new interesting people. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thanks a lot as well to all of the, the listeners today to the Top Tech Leaders podcast. Um, please subscribe to our channel, share feedback with us. We're always excited um, to learn what we can do better and uh, what kind of other guests or topics you would like to hear. So until next time, keep coding, keep leading.